And in this case, it was in collaboration with a law firm. And I was um, extracting, well, helping to analyze data from legal, uh, commercial legal documents, extracting data, and applying some text mining and information extraction techniques. So uh, I am currently working at Olsen University. So from 2017, March 2017, as September 2020, I worked as research associate in computer science at the Pervasive Computing Research Group. And from October 2020, I have been working as a lecturer in computer science, and, and I do teaching as well as research. So my research interest areas are data analysis, connected health, uh, pervasive computing, human activity recognition, and legal technology. Uh, well, here are some images about the UK. Sorry, that's what comes to mind for people when you think about the UK. And yes, like, uh, I don't know, Second World War, Sherlock Holmes, uh, Shakespeare, the Queen, Beatles. You see the famous uh, flag, uh, castles, football. Uh, also, yeah, the food and drink, Alan Turing, uh, Churchill. The weather, which is mostly raining uh, most of the year. So that's uh, what people have in mind about the UK. And well, this is a map of the UK because it's a bit confusing. I mean, it was confusing for me when I went there uh, because there's Great Britain, UK, England. So uh, Great Britain is a big island on the right. The island of Ireland is on the, the one on the left. So it's the uh, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. You see uh, that's this divided into four countries, Wales, England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. The one here is, well, the Republic of Ireland. So I am uh, living and working in Northern Ireland, which is in the north of the island of Ireland. And well, I'll talk about also university. That's, this is where I work. Uh, it was established in 1968, and then it merged with another University in 1994. It has four campuses in the country. That's in Belfast, Coleraine, McGee, and Jordanstown. Nowadays, two campuses have merged, so it's the new campus is in, in Belfast. So Belfast is around here. And that, that photo is from the one of the old campus. It's very nice, but it was uh, well a bit old, so the new the new one is more more modern. So the School of Computing is divided into two research groups. The one is the Pervasive Computing Research Group, the one I uh, belong to. The other one is the Artificial Intelligence and Applications. So as you can see, there can be there are some overlaps because in both cases there's machine learning, data analysis involved. Uh, I think one of the main differences is that uh, for the Pervasive Computing, we do more practical things. We do the data analysis and we try to apply them using sensors or hardware. In the case of artificial intelligence, it's more uh, theoretical. It's not about the, uh, the, the results are not that much uh, applied practically, although it says applications. So the Pervasive Computing Research Group, uh, the, some of the main themes are smart environments, smart communities, and smart cities. It is less led by Professor Chris Nugent, who is also the head of school of computing. Uh, he's my, my boss. So the research themes are activity recognition within smart environments, behavior change and lifestyle monitoring, crowd labeling of physical activity, online data repositories, and technology adoption modeling. So here are some of the, well, you can see some uh, more information, more details about the core research themes. Uh, in this, you can see the Top left, there's uh, information and visualization, then assistive technologies, mobile applications, activity behavior recognition, wearable techn technologies, and usability and human computer interaction. For information and visualization, we do, well, uh, we do at the research group different things like visualizing. Uh, in this case, what has been shown here is a simula simulated environment we, we use to collect data. So the sensors are simulated. And these circles uh, mean time of the day, time when something happens. So we can have different, uh, different uh, of these circles represent days, and the the color represents the level of activity. In that case, someone living in that environment. 
Then about assistive, te assistive technologies is to support people with more uh, clean and clear user interfaces. For example, the elderly, people with uh, eyesight, problems in, the, in their eyes. Uh, for mobile applications, we apply a lot to health. For example, uh, in that case, specific case, specific case is for reminders, for example, for the elderly. The, as you can see, it has just three elements, one uh, clock, one button for create a new reminder and view your reminders. So that helps people with maybe with dementia. Uh, okay. Um, in the signal, it's gone. Yeah, oh, thank you. So, well, in this case, the uh, activity and behavioral recognition, we use sensors like uh, like wearable devices, like uh, smart watches or fit fitness bands, as well as sensors that you could put in the place, in the room, like the grill ambient sensors. And from there we can get information from, depending on the person. In this case, the the person is having, has sensors in different parts of the body, and we can get signals. So based on these signals, we can uh, analyze that data. So obviously, well, you know, about the big data, the more data we have, the more useful it is to, you know, interpret and find patterns of people's activities. And in the case of wearable technologies, it's not just uh, smart watches. It also, it also involves uh, clothes. We can embed like chips in the, in the clothes. And about usability and human computer interaction, we use, we have using, for example, uh, eye trackers. In this case, is they can be in the form of like uh, goggles, which has like some sensor here that you can see where your eyes are moving, or your yeah your your, your eyes where you are looking at, as well as some other devices in the in the in front of the monitor. So in this case, this is what the person is looking at. You know, it's like a, I think like a Facebook uh, page. So it can tell you the the order. Okay, number one. Okay, they, maybe they look first at on top, then each point in sequential order. In the image on the right, it shows a heat map. So the part, the areas in red are where the, the person looks more for more time, and then they move around their eyesight. So that's useful, has different applications. Uh, there has been one project that at the university with uh, BT, which is uh, British uh, Telecommunications, and they provide, uh, yeah, they provide mobile uh, as well as uh, telephone uh, services, as well as um, cable, like uh, yeah, for watching TV. And in that case, uh, they, they use eye trackers to see, or say, to check where people were looking at more in the screen and improve their services to keep uh, people more uh, engaged. So, yeah. Oh, it's back. Can you please? Uh, the next slide. <laughs> yes, so these are uh, some of the resources at the group. Um, here it is shown the map of the one of the the labs and how a floor mat, there was a, something like this. This is a, a part of a floor mat that was put in all around the, this area and it was a pressure sensor so you could detect where people were moving around. The, and those, uh, the images on the right shows uh, wearable devices. In the, on top, there's like a smartwatch. Uh, the bottom is uh, uh, some type of bracelet. Each of them provide different um, different signals, different sensors, has different sensors. Um, and this colleague is using that device, getting data from the, the device that he has in his right uh, hand. So as you can see, all of these well, are part of the IoT, uh, Internet of Things because these, uh, eventually these are all basically sensors that collect data from people or from the environment and that are used to be uh, analyzed for some purpose. In this case, well, could be to detect abnormal behavior in humans or the, the environment. And this is um, the image of the living room at the previous lab. Uh, basically, this is not a living room that we used for, for us. It's more for collect data and for doing experiments. This uh, lab has some sensors integrated, the, the, has the, the floor mat. And there was also a kitchen uh, environment. Yeah, this one, that, and we put sensors, uh, different parts, like uh, thermal sensors, um, 
These are contact sensors. As you can see, it has it's a magnetic switch. So basically, there are two parts. Whenever they are uh, together, it's one state. It's like zero. If you separate them, it's one. So in this case, one of the studies we did is, OK, that users um, prepare a drink. And whenever they, they go uh, and take the coffee, for example, they separate the, the jar and the sensor from the one that is there. And that indicates that the user were using the, the coffee, the coffee uh, container. Then they pour the coffee, they put it back, and then that closes the, yeah, kind of like the, the circles. We say that was the time, how much, how long it took for the, the person to use the, the coffee. So that's one uh, basic example. Another one is using this type of sensors in doors, for example, in, a, in the frame of the door and in the door. So whenever the door opens, it changed. Well, it changed the state from well from being together to open, and that is useful for monitoring activities of elderly people. Uh, sometimes they ask elderly people with dementia or or just elderly people, but that they they don't remember very well many things. Uh, for example, at night, how how many times do you go to the toilet at night? And they could say, uh, oh, I just go. Uh, three times or four times. In reality, they went maybe six or seven, but it's just that they don't remember. But with this type of sensors, they, they will know exactly uh, how many times and at what time, how long do they took to be in the toilet. And that helps to, has to do with, okay, to know uh, about, uh, yeah, the, if they go to the toilet a lot, that could indicate the presence of infections or of health problems. And well, this, uh, these are the new labs at the Belfast campus. And well, this is the uh, Dr. Sahiran Abdurmana and Dr. Uh, Apiradi Lin from the Prince of Songkla University, which we were visiting last uh, last month. Well, Sahiran was uh, for four months. And as you can see, these are floor sensors, the new floor sensors. This each one of these you can uh, connect it in in the in any way that is more convenient for the data collection. In this case, it's uh, like a two two per three. This is like three three per three. So it depends on the type of data collection. And what you get is a is a pressure sensor like the where the person is standing on the on that mat. Uh, there is a robot that is also some students have been programming the robot for effective computing for like uh, you know supporting people with isolation elderly. And the image here shows the radar. You know, that's uh, we have a radar that indicates how many people are in the room and where they are they are moving. So there are different devices. Uh, depends obviously on the type of project. Um, but there are there's a new space at the new campus, and that's Dr. Uh, Idongesi Ekerete from Nigeria that he's also been working in the in the group. Uh, So this is a, well, a lot of the research I have been working on has been as part of the, this project. It's the Northern Ireland Connected Health Innovation Center, which is funded by Invest NI, and that supports business-led collaborative connected health research between academia, industry, and government. So, well, so the idea is that to have involved of the university, industry, and government. So companies come with ideas, and they talk to us. So we have like the researchers with specific skills to work on that project. We create some prototype and then we give that prototype to the, the, the company. And the IP is, uh, belongs to, part of that is from the, to the university and the other part to the company. So they can then make a commercial product. Uh, in the case of researchers, we can, if we get like a, like a patent, we can get like IP. Uh, So, well, now I'll move and talk about the Internet of Things. So, uh, the definition by Oracle about Internet of Things is, well, it describes the network of physical objects, which called things, that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the Internet. Well, you have heard different de definitions. And in some cases, it refers to the Internet of Objects, sorry, the Internet of Everything. So in that case, we're thinking about things like uh, inanimated objects. 
but we are also we, we have this type of devices on us like smart watches also like animals like cows if they put them sensors they also become things so at some point everything can have like this type of sensors uh, everything is connected to the internet but that's the rationale we are connected data and yes to fix oh yes that's fine okay you need to three minutes or we can talk something we are uh, okay. Are you going to keep the the, the PowerPoint or? Yeah, yeah, we're going to keep it. We're going to pick first. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so far, do you have any questions? But they are fixing that there's some technical problems, but uh, I don't know if you have any questions or online. Nope. Okay. Ah, right, okay. No, no, I mean, I mean, you can ask any Yeah. Uh, oh, any of you want to start in the UK? Okay. You can, yeah, you can also ask any questions you have. I'm 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're back. Yes, uh, if you please, well, just a recap about Internet of Things. Uh, we think about in, inanimated objects, but it could be also uh, living things like plants, animals, or people. So now it will be like the Internet of Everything at some point, and yeah, the number of devices connected to the Internet is, is growing. So experts, well, according to Oracle, experts are expected that the numbers of IoT devices connected will grow to 22 billion by 2025. So that's, uh, in, for in the next two years, they will even grow more. So again, well, this is a good um, area of research, as area of uh, doing um, work. If you are interested in working with sensors, working with uh, signal, and there are different applications, and you can see, well, in this, in this image, things like uh, well, like um, devices on cars, airplanes, or on shopping carts, on kettles, anything that could be you put a sensor and you can detect, use that to detect the patterns in humans as well as in even in usage. You can, like for example, you see the the light bulb, uh, the fridge. You how much uh, electricity the the devices are using, but not just that. You can be creative. But the good thing is that you can be creative and you know get more information about this, not just the voltage, but just uh, even have like personalized solutions for people, like who is using this device and what is best to make it better for people, not just for convenience, but also for people with disabilities or the elderly that they maybe have less mobility. Uh, well, in these diagrams, there. Well, this is uh, maybe the main slide that shows the challenges and opportunities. This is from a research paper that gave us a good summary. So basically, there are in terms of uh, secu security, like having unsecured devices, network uh, can block unwanted traffic or detect suspicious behavior. In terms of network challenges, there's scalability, diversity, open networking interface, and low power communication. In terms of software development, well, that's uh, big data and the three Bs, the volume, variety, and velocity. There's also self-configuration that is up to or related to network configuration. And well, new and complex dependencies like modeling, modeling human behaviors, like they call human in the loop. So going back to security, probably you not sure if you have heard, but in the news there was uh, in the US and in the UK, there were some problems with for example, like they bought uh, teddy bears for kids to have like, uh, okay, they, they could talk to the teddy bear and the teddy bear had like some, the things that they react, but the teddy bear had like cameras in the eyes that would help to recognize the kid and interact better. But what they didn't know is that uh, hackers could, you know, get the image, uh, what the teddy bear was looking at for like the, the kids. So in that case, that was, yeah, like very risky. The same with baby monitors. They put the baby uh, monitor with the cameras, but that could be hacked. If it's not well protected, uh, that could be hacked. And in one of these cases, it was very bad because the password was something like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, something like that. So it was even worse. I mean, coming from that type of companies. Um, the, the devices should be secure, should be well, strong passwords, uh, double to authentication as well as the the network in terms of network challenges yeah it comes a scalability how many how many devices you can you connect how much data can you transmit because at some point if you don't plan uh appropriately that could be overwhelmed and then that could this system could crash and then you could uh, lose data if we think about like everyday appliances or activities of daily living 
maybe for us, maybe that's not a big deal, but if it's like the elderly or people that are, I don't know, they're monitoring their heart or some health condition, that could be critical because they could, they could, uh, for example, like a peacemakers or something like that, that if they lose information, they, they could get uh, some injury or some more serious uh, condition. Um, well, what else? Yeah, have diversity of the network interface. Um, low power communication. There are some devices that uh, have like, there are like these new protocols that communicate uh, sensors. They are low power and they communicate. Uh, I can't remember the name, the name of the sensors, but they in the UK they put that they use for well in Ireland they use that for farming. So they put that in close to crops. Very small sensors that just collect data like uh, okay temperature, uh, yeah time of the day, temperature, humidity. So that in terms of like okay to know the best conditions for the plants to grow, and all that data is uh, sent via I don't know depends on the time that they is collected every five minutes, every 10 minutes, and that's sent as a message in text, the text format, which is like, I don't know, maybe 1K, 1 kilobyte or less. So that's very uh, convenient. But if you have devices that collect much more data, yeah, you, sh you have to plan uh, accordingly. In terms of software development, uh, yes, that there are new uh, libraries, new capabilities that uh, that scientists, researchers are using, like, for example, like TensorFlow, uh, like the libraries like TensorFlow, Keras, uh, in languages like Python or R. So that's the part of the software, but there's also the part of the hardware in which, uh, you know, the processing power of a, like average computer is not enough. So you need to use GPUs, graphical, uh, processing units that are used for video games, but they are used for processing this type of uh, big data. And they, they are much more expensive. Some of the makers are like um, yeah. NVIDIA. NVIDIA, the, that's the graphic cards uh, maker. And well, also about uh, self-configuration, self you have to, the network should be, the architecture of the network should be well, uh, well designed. That something that is very useful is, uh, well, I, I think as far as Sajidan uh, told me that you have like, um, here like Cisco, that, you know, that type of certifications and knowledge about network networks is very useful to, to see what is appropriate. And um, as with everything else, you cannot apply the same solution to all problems. You have to study the problem uh, in depth and then you adequate the specific solution for each case. And finally, uh, modeling human behaviors, that's changing more and more. Nowadays, probably, probably all of us here in the room have like a smartphone, and even that smartphone, it, is, it has an many sensors, accelerometer, uh, gyroscope, and magnetometer. Just with that, it's kind of easy to know or infer the activities, like if we are sitting or if we are active, if we are walking. That's, and that's just very um, straightforward. If you go deep into the, into the data collected and you, you if you use more sensors you'll get much more information about the patterns uh next please okay so i'll i'll now talk about some of the projects that have been involved which have uh in which iot has been applied if there is enough time uh, i'll mention all the projects but i will focus on the ones that are about uh, iot so the first project was a uh, smart home in a box. And the objectives of the study was to investigate the challenges with the design and deployment of a smart home in a box, we call the, the SHIP approach to monitoring people with dementia, we call uh, PWD, that uh, their well-being in a care home. So this could support future uh, SHIP implementations to have an adequate and prompt deployment allowing research to focus on the data collection analysis and analysis aspects. Basically, the idea was to have, a, as they call it, like a smart home in a box. Probably you have heard about smart home. And one of the, some of the capabilities like, well, you could um, have like this type of virtual assistance like Google uh, Home or Amazon Echo or Amazon Dot. And then you can uh, say commands, okay, turn, off the, turn on the lights, turn on the, uh, turn off the lights, put some music, that's kind of like more for convenience. 
other people like uh, elderly or people with dementia may say, uh, what's my schedule for today? And they will remind them about their schedule. So that's um, the tendency is to have these uh, this, uh, connections. Well, that's kind of put that smart in the home. One of the problems is that uh, most houses around the world were not built with connectivity in mind. So sometimes the Wi-Fi network won't go through. There could be some problems. And like uh, average, per, average people don't, um, don't know, don't have technical knowledge. So if you think about, for example, like an elderly person, if, they, if the connection is uh, broken with the device, they they will know what to do or how to fix it. So that's one another problem. Um, so what we try what we try to do with this uh, project was to have a smart home in a box, basically. So we have a box with sensors, and then we give to the user, and the user should be able to install the sensors in the home. So it's not about changing the, the their home or uh, let's say like making holes like drilling or anything like that. Just attach the sensors with some like uh, Velcro or some other other material you could attach and be attached. But they, they should be able to do that by themselves. The type of sensors that were uh, included in the box were a thermal sensor. This one, uh, I'll show you well in the next slide, but it is, it is on the ceiling of the room, maybe ideally in the center of the room, and that goes covers an area, uh, like a like an area of view, so where people are walking around, so you know where the person is in the room. Uh, it includes uh, well, an antenna, uh, contact sensors, like the ones I talked to you before about, a PIR sensor, uh, that's for proximity, infrared sensor, uh, yeah, more contact sensors, PIR sensors, uh, a small computer, that's a Raspberry Pi, and that's one part is for like local processing and collecting the data, and the other is for sending, so it's actually two of them. And also like radio frequency transmitter and receiver of signals, that's what the antenna is attached for. So all of this, the, the user should be able to, to connect them and, okay, depending on the architecture, depending on the rooms that they will put these sensors on. So you may ask, okay, how do the user will know where to connect things? Uh, in addition to the sensors, we provided a, a tablet with, which has a NFC, NFC tag reader. Each of the sensors have like NFC tag, so you see it's a uh, near. Uh, I can't remember the name. It's like near near range. Uh, can remember the acronym, but basically it's a tag that you put and you can scan, similar to a QR code, and a video will appear. And that's one of my colleagues and explained like, well, okay, this is a thermal sensors, what it does, how to connect it, and like a help, and they can see the video as many times as required as a user. Uh, yeah. Next, please. So, yes, the sensors used were thermal, contact, uh, passive infrared sensors, and audio level sensors. So this is the thermal sensor I was telling you about. This is how it is placed on the ceiling, and this is the view. And you may, like, that's very blurry, and that's happening to tell what is in there. The reason for being blurry is to protect the privacy of the person. So uh, one will say, well, you can use the camera, and that's it. But people want, you know, the, obviously, we all want the, our privacy. So, but here you can see that there's that blob, that pixelated area in white, is a person. And we can see how that image, how, how that pixelated area moves around the, the room. That's it. Those are the contact sensors, in this case, in a cupboard, where you open and close. Uh, the proximity sensor, this is the audio sensor. Again, it's like very simple, and this is like a like a Ava Alafruit type of board, and this is the, actually the sensor. So that, that was connected there, and we the reason for using this. I mean, we try different things. These are the colleagues that work on the actually on the electronics part of this. Mm. The reason was to make it as convenient as uh, affordable, low cost. And also that it can it could be installed. Um, it didn't took much space in the in the room. So one way that we tried to do that was using uh, like this shape. And this is we have here as well, like a smoke detector. So this is the type of 
smoke detectors that are typical in the UK. So a way to do that was to put it in, in that kind of like case so that you have the camera and you have the, the audio sensor here and you can put it in that box, put it there, and that's like a smoke detector. And the thing is that one of the reasons for doing that, uh, also another reason is because some of the elderly people were a bit, when we put just like this, the sensors visible, you know, uh, just like that, uh, some of them were like uh, flashing, that you know, like with a red light flashing, and some of them were a bit scared. They told the nurse, okay, I see like there's a, looks like there's like an airplane coming, it's like, why? why they, they, you know, imagine your, your room dark and that's uh, like something blinking there. And it's, it's people who don't know what's going on in their heads, maybe like a memory or something. So because they were distressed, well, in that case, couldn't sleep because she was thinking like there was some plane or some object there in the ceiling. That was some more, uh, a way to, you know, to to not affect the the people we, because we when we test this in the lab we didn't think much about okay maybe they will be like sleeping and they were looking at the ceiling and they will see like that light uh, so that's again one of the things that we work with some designers which help us to produce this case the one on the right i think it was the previous one which was uh we had a 3d printer which was kind of like a pro prototypes this one is more for like a better quality prototypes uh sorry could, next please so the ship, the smart home in a box, was evaluated in via installing in the rooms in, a, in of people with dementia with varying degrees of dementia in the care house, care home in Belfast. So the sensors were installed to test their capabilities for detecting activities activities of daily living. Um, activities of daily living are the types of activity that we all do. For example, that are uh, okay when we go to bed the next morning. We wake up, we uh, we step out of bed, we put our feet on the ground, we stand up, maybe go to the toilet, go to find clothes, then prepare breakfast, brush teeth. So all of those things that are, uh, you know, straightforward to us and we don't think much about this, more like automatically we do them. The elderly people are people with disabilities. For them, sometimes they have an like injury in the arm and it's like, okay, they cannot, or in the feet, so they cannot walk. Well, so they need a carer, someone to help them to okay, get up, or maybe like to for brush their teeth or clothes, clothing. So, if you are, if people that require help to with in their activities of daily living, well, they are uh, they depend on other people, and they are yeah considered as uh, not disabled, but they depend from relatives or other carers. This is the Samson photos of Care House Home. It's a care home in Belfast. This is the outside part. This is one of the typical uh, rooms, basically as well, a living room. And this is a corridor. As you can see, the well, this design was meant to make it look like a, like a like a some type of street street for some design typical in in the UK, so that they have like some memories because that that also helped them to you know remember about when they were young or remember things so all of the, every element i mean they put a lot of attention to to details for the elderly to remember uh, next please so the main findings of the study were that well most care home buildings were not originally designed to appropriately install ambient sensors and installation of these type of sensors should be adapted depending on the specific case of the care home where they will be installed so as you can see in this case, these conclusions were okay, kind of like uh, straightforward, kind of something to that we may have inferred from the beginning. But the reason for the study was to prove okay that was our hypothesis. Okay, that has been confirmed with these conclusions. And what are we going to do next? So that's you know part of that that research process. We have an idea, the hypothesis. So it may have been the case that okay our hypothesis was wrong. But based on this, we can use this as a baseline for the future work and any room for this uh, this type of project. Um, okay, now I will mention this uh, other project, which was thermal vision based fall detection. So, well, um, in Alberta Falls, it's like suddenly falls can cause serious and potentially fatal injuries to at risk individuals. 
So one such community at risk is the elderly population where age-related complications such as uh, osteoporosis or dementia can increase the incidence and negative impact of such falls. And well, for example, I'm not sure uh, about in, in Thailand, but in Mexico, uh, where I'm from, and in the UK, sometimes it's very common that elderly people uh, have a fall, for example, in the night, they go to the toilet, then they go, uh, they fall there, and they break their hip, and they are just there in the, in the floor of the bathroom all night until someone goes there and finds them. And by then it's like, okay, not too late, they will be alive, but if the sooner the response, the better to treat any like a uh, fractured bone or hip. So, well, typically, and also depends uh, as well, how, how do they fall? In this case, you can see, okay, maybe this elderly people, elderly person put their, their hand there, but then this part, the bones of the arm could be injured. Maybe they fall, uh, that was very quick and they hit their head. So it depends on how they fall. So that's very important to, you know, to know or to detect this type of well, falls. So, yeah, also falls within that community has been identified as a leading cause of injury related preventable death, hospitalization, and reduction of quality of life. That, again, has to do with that as we age, we lose mobility, maybe we are not as agile. Some people, uh, elderly people, don't walk uh, obviously the same. They maybe their feet more like, uh, they don't lift the, the feet. So then that could cause this type of falls. Uh, well, rapid detection and reaction to fall events has shown to be critical to reduce the negative effects of falls. There are some existing solutions, but they have several deficiencies related to the, to the core approach that has been adopted. So the approach we propose in this work was an ensemble of thermal vision based big data facilitated solutions that aimed to address some of the deficiencies. And here are some, this was published in an academic paper, and here are some of the, the images that were from, from that paper. As you can see in this image, um, it's a similar type of thermal sensor. And it's, well, the text is that a falling individual as perceived using the ceiling mount mounted thermal vision sensors employed by the solution. So in this figure, um, in the figure, uh, superimposed square highlighting the fallen individual. So you may ask, okay, how do you identify that this uh, person falling? So what we did was among uh, people, researchers and PhD students, we collect data. Basically, we ask uh, many people to, okay, come, there's a thermal sensor there. We are going to take uh, different um, yeah, images of you standing. Okay, stand like this, maybe stand like you have you, as if you were walking, stand in different positions. Then also images like sitting, sitting in different ways, and images of the, like, uh, as pretending to fall, like on the ground. So with those images, we trained uh, a classifier. And in that case, that the system has a classifier. So whenever it, it takes frame by frame, so at some point in that frame, uh, takes the frame and then, okay, uh, applies the classifier and see, okay, there's, I don't know, maybe 80% that this uh, image shows a, a person standing. Okay, that's fine. Maybe if it shows that percentage, that high percentage that the, the person is sitting or standing, that's fine. If the person, if the image shows a high, uh, percentage that the person is uh, like lying down on the floor and if that image is the same for say for example five minutes then okay something may be wrong Th then an automated reminder is sent to a relative or to a carer so that how it works as you see it combines again sensors connectivity and uh, machine learning in this case and well, this is this next image shows a pair of Wi-Fi enabled thermal vision sensors, which interoperate, interoperate um, with the solution. And well, this is the architecture of the sensor central platform that we use to collect the data. And yeah, there are, if you are interested in, in more on the details, I can uh, well you can contact me or uh, Sahidan and I can send you the the details. But basically, that involves uh, 
uh, obviously the sensors, the applications, many uh, well communication protocols because th that depends on the the types of uh, sensors. And the other image shows a graphical overview of the detection process that was facilitated through a convolutional neural network. <laughs> The amber sections are involved with the training uh, model. So you see there's like the annotation, annotations, no internal scenes. That's what we did in getting the or training the, the, the classifier. That's the, the CMN. And there are some unseen thermal scenes. Those unseen thermal scenes are important because that could be that the person have uh, maybe they they have like a they are like elderly person, elderly people, like a grandfather and a grand model and then they have a the grandkid is visiting. So then the thermal sensor notice that there's like a the the image of a of a kid. And that again maybe the, the kid, you know, maybe they are it's like, like small kid, they are playing on the ground and all that. So but that you know it's like a, maybe like smaller frame than a like an adult. So because that could be tricky. Okay the, the kid is playing in the on the on the ground. But that's that that could trigger a false alarm, or the person could have like a like a pet animal, like a dog or cat at home. So those are the unseen thermal scenes, then the train model and the the classification. This image shows uh, well, it's a graphical illustration of the output of the blob detection processes that was leveraged by the logical fault detection process. That's uh, from the raw scene the image uh, the, on the left, the one on the right, um, sorry, the one on the left shows a blob uh, that was identified in, in green, and this, that was from an individual working at a computer which has gradually heated and is therefore ignored by the blob identification process. So that's the person sitting at a, at a computer, and you can see that the, how the blob was identified based on the image of the the, the classifier that was trained, okay, that person is sitting, so that was identified, and that's the what was what is indicated in in, with, in green. The one, the, this image on the on the bottom shows an example of a composite fall scene depicting a standing individual, a subsequent fall, and a rested fallen state. So from here, probably you see just a, a bunch of pixels. It's not very clear. But here is yeah, the person like, walking. You see this from the top, so he's like walking. Then at this point is falling or pretending to fall. And here where the where the, the blob is the, the pixels are more uh, longer is that the person on the ground. So for us, yeah, this is difficult to distinguish uh, like this. But for the system and with the labels we know uh, the, the positions that the person that the people are. And here are the results that we obtained with the three, we used three different uh, techniques. So the, using a logical process, the highest uh, accuracy was, well, the detection rate, the higher was uh, in a single occupancy office. And that's kind of straightforward. If, you, if there's only one person there, this is easier to detect than, rather than if it's like, like an office with, with many people. Uh, in the second approach, that was via scene analysis. So the highest again was in a single occupancy office. We also use like a real real world living room in both cases. Although in the first case we also used a simulated um, living room. And finally, this one was using a composite scene analysis, combining uh, both approaches. And as you can see, that was uh, it obtained the, the lowest detection rate. So two of the fault detection processes proposed have shown uh, promise through accurate identification of fault events from the data gathered through non-obtrusive thermal vision sensors. And this solution was deployed uh, to a variety of elderly uh, care facilities in Northern Ireland. So we are still doing some data analysis on, on, the, on, those, on that data. Okay, so now I will talk about uh, another project that uses uh, sensors. This was uh, about diabetic foot disease. Probably you, you have heard uh, well about the, the, the condition of diabetes. Uh, some people that have diabetes are affected in their feet. 
uh, the, the, the feet of a diabetic patient can get injuries. And the reason of that is because they start feeling a uh, sensation in the skin. So here you have in the bottom, in this uh, image, you can see different stages, like, a, well, like there's no problems, and then start like a red rash, and all the stages of deterioration and injury until probably like gangrene and then uh, possible amputation that's cutting the, the leg or the, 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 the foot. Um, well, a foot also precedes more than 80% of the amputations in the, in the United Kingdom. The increase in two degrees Celsius is in the temperature of the surface of the feet could be an early indication of an injury or inflammation. So the proposed solution was in the form of a mobile app and for Android that uses the data capture from a free one clear one thermal camera. Uh, the, the camera is like this. So it's a small, yeah, written a small sensor that attached to the to the mobile phone. And then you can take the thermal images and the you what you capture is the thermal, are the thermal images and a matrix of temperatures. So a thermal image in RGB and a temperature matrix in degrees Celsius are captured. And the images in the matrix were sent to a server for image processing. We used Java and MATLAB. The results were sent back to the mobile app in the form of an image with the affected area. This image shows the architecture of the system where we have well, the mobile app and the, the application. The images are saved locally using the SQLite database in the, in the device. And we also have the server, a Java REST interface. Then we have the, the controller for both the database services and the analysis services. On the database services, we have used two databases, uh, MongoDB and MySQL, one for images and temperature data, the other for the patient data and metadata. For the analysis services, we use supervised learning and RCNN. Also, uh, image processing, we use background subtraction and temperature analysis for the hotspot detection. So this is the, the screen from the app. This is the first one, what the, you open the app and this is the first screen. Very simple. Uh, we have home, profile, log, and take a photo. Also, you can take a photo here, but actually you can see the photos that were taken. This is just to take the photo, and that's just like a design, kind of like an artistic design. And so the next uh, image shows, okay, you press the, take a, a photo, and then the camera is activated, and you are, in this case, uh, the feet of, of the patient are going to you take the photo, and that's how they appear in, as a thermal uh, image. And from the user's perspective, you open the app, the app, you take the photo, you send it, and then after a minute, a minute or two, yeah, around a minute, you get something like in the last image. Okay, your left foot has two hotspots, and then there's some message saying like, okay, it's it will be recommended to see the your doctor. But that's what the users see. Behind that, there's a lot of things going on. Um, something to take into account from the user uh, interface or user experience perspective is that at first we try to use um, a selfie stick. We, we, we were thinking about, okay, maybe the, the patient will should be able to take the photos themselves. We use a selfie stick and they, you know, sit and put the, take the photos. But it was very, it was difficult even for us to take good photos like that. And if you think about elderly people or people with problems, if they don't have like a steady hand and they took like photos and they could be uh, not in the in, in a good position or maybe off, off out of the frame. So in the end, the solution was, okay, assuming that the person has a relative or carer and they are the ones taking the, the photos of the feet. So yes, as I mentioned, yes, um, the Android app uses the FLIR1 internal camera connected to the smartphone the RGB image, thermal image, and the temperature data are collected from each pixel. And the images are sent to a server to be processed and the results are stored in a SQLite database on the smartphone. So object detection was performed using deep learning techniques. And for we use knowledge, knowledge transfer techniques uh, by using pre-trained models. So in this case, we use um, AlexNet which is trained with more than 1 million of images from the ImageNet 
data set classified in a thousand categories. So again, that's probably if you can work with uh, deep learning techniques of uh, this type of classifiers, you know that there are pre-trained models that you already are already kind of to, for you to use, and you can uh, then use that as a starting point. Then you can add your own images. So that's kind of like what we did. We use uh, a ground truth data of 124 labeled images. And we use data augmentation techniques to get more data because it's difficult, uh, I don't know, it's difficult to get images of fit on the internet to detect. So we use, we recruit uh, PhD students, uh, researchers as volunteers to, okay, we need <laughs> images of fit and then data augmented them to have different positions uh, and have like a more variety in the images. So. These are the details of the graphic card that we use. It was an NVIDIA GTX 1080 uh, with 8 gigabytes of memory that was used for training. And the best results were obtained training for 100 epochs with a mini batch of size 64. We tried different things. Uh, for this project, we were three people involved in the development in, in the as well as in the data analysis. So it was quite um, yeah, complex to, to do, and we tried different things. Some, didn't work, so it was a good uh, project. So here are some of the operations we did, um, like for, like the morphological operations. That's removing the background. Ideally, yeah, in the, like in the lab conditions, you will see something like a like a dark background, and that's easy for you to extract the 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 fit, but. If there are many things in the background, that's difficult. So that was by itself like a, a challenge. Also, border detection, at missing regions of the food image, like in this case. And well, for the, the solution or the approach we took, uh, and well, we, as I mentioned, we were three people from computing, but also we have two colleagues from the School of Podiatry, which are experts in in this area and see patients with diabetes and they know, okay, how to detect hotspots. They suggested to use, okay, why don't you, from, you take photos of the two feet and then why don't you invert one of them and put it uh, merge with the, and merge the feet. So that's what the right foot is inverted and then merged with the left foot. And if you remember for both images, we have a, uh, both the, well, the thermal image as well as the matrix of temperatures. So we compared both matrix matrices. And if there is a, a difference of 2.2 degrees, that indicates a hotspot. And we ask the, the podiatry colleagues, okay, is that accurate? Is that good enough? And they say, yeah, that, that, that's fine. Typically they are just, they have the injury in one of the feet. And if it's like early detection, that's a, a way to, that's, that's what they actually do anyway, manually. So with this, in this case, uh, that's the approach we took. And for this project, the idea was not to replace uh, the to replace the health staff, but more to support them. But if you think about diabetic people, in this case, um, they have to go to checks maybe weekly or every two weeks, and that cost to the medical doctors, to the health system, and that could be expensive just to okay check how your feet are. This reduces that cost by having like a home uh, solution where they just take the photos and if there's some indication if they if they had this this solution, instead of going to see the GP, the doctor every week or every two weeks, they could go every month. That reduces the cost. That may also cost reduces their the patient's cost to go to see to see the doctor. Uh, this project is still being uh, continued by other colleagues, which uh, have been trying to de to develop a, a more a more more a much more polished version, like a more com for a commercial product. And there are some um, papers that academic papers that resulted from this. So if you are interested, you can uh, well look online, or I will share my slides later with Sahidan. So if you uh, and he can share them with you if you would like to see more details. Okay, and the last uh, project I'll talk about uh, is an ongoing collaboration with the universities of Nottingham Trent and Manchester. 
So this is the abnormal, abnormal behavior detection in activities of daily living. As I mentioned before, activities of daily living are the type of activities that uh, we should be able to do by, on our own. And we don't depend on anyone to do them, like uh, take a shower, uh, go to the toilet, dress, wake up, stand up, uh, that kind of activities. In this case, the activities considered were preparing and drinking tea and coffee. And we choose these activities because they are considered as common between most people that they perform many times during the day. So the frequent detection of incomplete ADLs can be used to alert relatives or carers of a possible health problem. Um, yes, and that could be in the in the in the sense of uh, something that happens suddenly, like a fall, or if they are preparing something on the in the kitchen, like stove. The, you know, they've had the fire on, and then if they had mild dementia, they they could just forget about that they have something on the there's some fire there, and they could just walk around the living room, and then an accident could happen. The same as uh, yeah, even like food poisoning. That's something that could happen suddenly. If some, if they have mild dementia and eat, I don't know, or drink something like uh, for cleaning the dishes, and they think it's like orange juice or, or something, if they fall on the ground and they start uh, having problems, that could be detected by sensors, which then could alert uh, the relatives or their carers. And in the second case, uh, the another health problem is like the ones that are progressive. That means that as we age, we lose some abilities, mobility. The elderly, like um, osteoporosis, could be one case. Or if they, for example, um, want to reach for something on the kitchen, on the kitchen, but over time they may not be as strong, have problems with the bones or the muscles, that could be detected by this type of sensors. And over time, uh, they could be like, well, okay, maybe you are having this problem, you need to see the, the doctor. Um, a sensor system could send reminders to users so that they could finish the activity for which they are following specific steps. That's in the sense of forgetting what they, the activity is. If they are in the kitchen and they are going to prepare like a meal, then they may start with the process, but then they go to the living room, they go to the toilet, then they go back to the living room, and then they are watching TV, and they forgot about the meal. That could happen to people with uh, dementia, or sometimes they just prepare something in the kitchen and they are, I don't know, just walking around, they go to the phone or they are disoriented. So with sensors, we could detect this and then alert the relative that the person is having uh, a problem. The environment to collect the data was in uh, the smart kitchen of the Pervasive Computing Research Group. And we use three types of sensors, contact, thermal, and accelerometers. This is the, well, the kitchen, and that's where the sensors were placed. We have, uh, there are three main areas in the, in the kitchen. The, that's the door area, the table, and the main kitchen. So the door area is where they go inside in the kitchen. Then typically they go to the main kitchen area where they prepare the drinks. They have, there's a fridge, microwave, and other things to add ingredients to, to prepare the, the drinks. And when they finish, they go to the, well, when they finish preparing the drink, they go to drink in the table. As you can see, these uh, little squares that are here are the contact sensors, like the, the, the door open or closes. And they were also placed in the cups and in the, the containers of coffee and tea. And the data was captured from 30 participants, um, 16 males and 14 females aged between 18 and 45 years old. They had the initiative to choose which drink to prepare and which steps. So in that sense, we didn't, we didn't give them instructions. Like, well, okay, you first have to go to the fridge, then to the kettle. No, it's like, okay, you go in the kitchen, prepare a drink and drink it in any order. And that's because typically that's what happens to us. And we do different ways, different, yeah. Also even different times to do things like how long we take to prepare the, the drink. And the only restrictions were that each participant was allowed to prepare only one drink. The drink had to be drunk at the table and the cup had to be placed close to the contact sensors in the washing area after finished drinking the, the drink. Uh, we have performed temporal, probabilistic and sequential analysis from this data. 
And as you can see, this is a sunburst diagram. Um, what this means, each there is a series of concentric circles that indicates the step and sequence of how people uh, perform the, the ADLs. So at the center, we have this just one circle, one color, that's opening the, the door because all of them had to open the door. It's just one, uh, they all had to do that. And from there, there are different uh, different activities there. They could either have to go to the one of the cupboards, the right cupboard, left cupboard, maybe to the kettle, the fridge. Um, there's, I can't remember the meaning of, of the colors, but they, they indicate a different uh, place where they go to the to do some activity or whatever contact sensors there. And from there, you can see the variety of, okay, how how many, each uh, path represents one participant. You can see that that one, for example, took a lot of time because there was like walking around the the kitchen, going and for different things. It was interesting that well, there was two participants that had exactly the same uh, the same path and they don't know each other. Um, but you can see different things, different patterns from this. And this was like a relatively um, small data collection. If you collect data over more time, you could get even better uh, patterns or more more information that could give you that could be useful for personalized solutions. And from this work, we have collected data, I think, like three or four times, and we have uh, published many papers. So again, if you are uh, interested or curious about this, you can um, yeah, contact me and I can give you some more information. And now I will talk about a collaboration that I did with, uh, we did with some colleagues from Mexico. This was part of a, a funding called the Global Challenges Research Fund, the GCRF. And the project was called uh, Low Cost Monitoring and Support for People with Dementia and Their Carers Using Smart Microphones. So these are the, the colleagues involved. Uh, well, also the organization is called CICESE, that's in the north of uh, Mexico. So, well, the outputs of this um, project were a methodology, a list of series of the scenarios that were identified in which smart microphones could be used in the context and scope of the project, such as data annotations, log activities of carers, and identify ADLs. Uh, an initial iteration of the first scenario was developed to annotate daily sounds from a user and data was collected. Something to mention is that what we called smart microphones are the type of uh, microphones like um, that virtual assistants have, like um, the Amazon uh, the Amazon Dot or the Google Home, the ones that are circular. These are what we call smart microphones because they are well, they are listening all the time. They are just waiting for the keyword, like okay, like okay, Google or Alexa. Then they are like okay, there's a prompt, and then there's a command. So this type of microphone that we use is similar. They are listening all the time for the environment. And the, the ADLs, the activities we consider are, are this. There were actually well, five types of sounds, running water from tap, flushing toilet, running water from the show, shower uh, faucet, and the blender working. There was one which was unknown sound, so any other sound that was not one of these was categorized as an unknown. And we also have a location, kitchen, bathroom, and as well as living room. So yes, this is the type of sensor that we used. This is from the, a company called Matrix. As you can see, this is, uh, well, it has um, a microphone. It's an array of microphones. It has eight microphones around the, around the surface of the device. And here are some of the uh, technical details, yeah, eight audio sensor digital microphones. There's uh, they have some LEDs. There's also well the RAM. There's flash memory. Also has a micro microcontroller. So some operations could be done on the device. This device is connected to a Raspberry Pi uh, microcomputer, and then uh, data is being well being collected. Some of the things that can be done with this are if you like. Internet of Things is, um, well, I, I like uh, that's a lot, a lot of fun. There's many tut uh, tutorials. For example, you can put the 
the others already code and tutorials that you could um, place the device and you from the LEDs you could put the, the device in the center of a room and if you like knock on here or knock there the LEDs will light on the direction of the sound so you, you can know where does the sound is coming from that could be I don't know the, probably you heard about like the IoT makers people that are as a hobby they build different uh, solutions for their houses one could be maybe security like okay if they want to know that uh, someone is coming at night or some strange noise from the door okay they they can just program the yeah, this device to listen all, all all night and see if there's some loud sound coming from the the door then that will trigger like a, some notification or some louder noise to to the to the user and this is the well the software um yeah and the second output was a software and a prototype to implement the process methodology which we called uh, isa that's the intelligent system for sound annotation thank you is uh in the if you one we have the components and architecture so the system, operating system is the raspbian which is from the raspberry pi then we have the matrix hall which is the interface between the between raspbian and the device you know for all the controllers we have then odas which controls the word the well the text with the direction of the of the sound then an audio classifier uh, snips ai is uh text to speech speech to text library and then we have the voice assistant and the matrix voice the that scenario is uh, the living room of one of the of my, our colleagues so he collected data in his uh, in his flat so he put the microphone array in the center and then collect the data and the overview of the functionality of isa is this so here at the very start you have the different uh, home activities then the microphones the, the sounds are detected by the microphones and then they are passed to the classifier which then in this case is to annotate data basically to, to put labels on data uh, in this case the data being audio sounds so the audio classifier uh, already had some uh, is already trained has some data and that's part of the audio data set so based on the, the once the, the sound is passed to the audio classifier it will ask uh, if it has some um, accuracy about the sound, maybe if it's like very high, it won't ask the, the user. But if it's less than the threshold, it will ask the user, okay, is this sound uh, the kitchen faucet? And then the voice assistant will, will ask the user. The user will say, uh, yes, that's the kitchen faucet at the kitchen. And it has to say that to say, okay, what is the sound and what the place indicate those because they, those two are then converted from speech to text and use the the what sound is and the place and that's added to the audio data set and well so the third output from this project was to strengthen col collaboration links between CCC and also university as you can see we visit this is the the, the care home that I talked about in the previous project these are some researchers from Mexico and we were taken on a tour on the care home uh, they explain us different things how they work because some things are even uh, depends on the place or culturally there are I mean care homes all around the world like uh, I mean here here Mexico the UK at the base they, they, they provide the same services but they, there may be some changes in their uh, let's say their operations um, so in this case we were well we visited the, this um home to see what were the what, what were the similarities and the difference with respect to the care home scene in mexico what things we could well, they we our colleagues we could learn from the care homes in the in the uk and okay so so far you have any any questions yeah I'm late to 
Assalamualaikum. <laughs> I'm so happy and uh, thank you so much. I have some question about what you're talking in network and software. And because I like software so much. And uh, also, I want to know what is the relationship between uh, uh, and uh, networking. BFD. Yes. Can I can I uh, ask many question because I have three questions. Can? But I ask the first question after I ask others. What is the relationship between IT and DFD? Second. Can? I'll ask one by one. So I guess I will forget. Uh, so okay. The in this case, the relation between DFD and IoT is the sensor, the, the key word in this case is sensor, which was the FLIR, the FLIR thermal camera attached to the um, to the mobile phone. And because that's com that's communicating the well the data from the from the that is captured from the well from the camera, is you will say, okay, it's not a sensor that's a one that you put uh, you you may think like a humidity or uh, accelerometer, but it's is one initial step. Uh, in addition to that one, that there could be other that could be integrated for that project, for well, for the uh, for detecting the oil source in the feed. That uh, that's the link. It's not exactly what you will may think as a typical. Why I asking you this? Because we are not medicine. Me, in my, for example, me, and my brother is a medicine. Um, as a doctor, me, I don't know nothing about doctor. I am a IT first year. And I would like to be an uh, engineer of uh, technology. I don't know nothing. And you talk about medicine because I ask you how you how what is the relationship between uh, DFD and IT and how we find. And also I listen to you. You talk. You talk with uh, uh, Audrey. Uh, Audrey, if, if, if they fall, how we detect if, uh, how we detect those those they fall in the bridge. Can, we can say uh, in capital, if you fall, can we find you? Like uh, someone who fall in the village, how we can detect if you don't, if don't, uh, if not uh, so, uh, that place don't have internet? How we can find this? Understand my question? Understand my questions? Two questions. First, we are not doctor, we are IT student. How we can how, uh, what is the relationship between DFD and IT technology? Second, you talk about elderly people. If they fall, or if they fall in the bridge, how we can find them? Uh, how we can find those? Uh, they fall in the village. Uh, the village don't have internet. How we can detect? Uh, detect? Thank you. Yeah, it's very clear uh, now to me. Uh, so yes, uh, the relation. What is the relationship between DFD and IT? Well, uh, in this case, basically, well, is using the, the the mobile phone and the sensor. The, the rationale behind the the project was that most people use or have access to smartphones. If you imagine, okay, they they have specialized equipment to. Well, in the first place, you have the human experts that they will take a look at the feed and they know, okay, there's maybe an injury or not. But then they also have the machines, more expensive, and they just sometimes they just stand up over like that, a scale, or they have their photos taken. And they, but those are big devices and they are connected with specialized software. So all of that, and it gives you lots of uh, parameters of output as they, okay, they you may have like, a, or the patient could have like the, could have DFD or a hotspot. Uh, so in this case, it's basically to have a low cost solution. Someone, most people could could afford like a, a smartphone. The FLIR camera, yes, that's more expensive. In that case, that's there, but that's the one that we use. We use like a medium range, not the not the more expensive, not the more uh, cheap. We will use something like the average type. And in this case, the idea is that okay, for the users to use the the device or the the system at home. They don't have to go to the doctor. They or they, if they go, they don't go that often. So this less, uh, yeah, less burden for them as well as for the health experts and the system. So the relationship with IT in that case will be to support the 
the health workers, you know, making the work again. Most of these technologies are not to replace doctors; is to support them in their work and also to support uh, to leverage the health system. Because you know, in, ah, in most countries, I think in, in Mexico and the UK, uh, the other day we went to uh, Hajai to a hospital, and you see people, you know, long queues. They are waiting. Staff are overworked, overloaded. If it, especially if it's like a public health system. If it's private, is in addition to being overwork, it's also expensive. Time, you know, time uh, there is costly. So that's basically to to alleviate that situation. Uh, so th that's uh, the relationship with with IT. Uh, in relation to your second question, the foot in the yes. Oh, sorry, there's. Uh, Hello. Yes. <laughs> I am. I am a medical doctor. So uh, I think that it has to do your question, perhaps, with the idea of temperature. So they are trying to detect 2.2 degrees yes. Celsius, yeah. the decrease in the temperature of the feet. No increase. 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 <laughs> in order to know if there is a hot hot uh, spot. Hot spot and to prevent the ulcers. So that's a, like a very initial um, step when the patient, they don't feel anything in, in that moment, but they begin with problems with the circulation, with the blood circulation, but also the nerves. You know that the nerves are involved in diabetic uh, in the long run. So this is to try to detect with enough time these kind of images in, in in here in the soles of the of the feet. So I think that's something that is very useful for us doctors and for patients too. Uh, asking him, you know, sorry. This is my first time, you know, I'm a I'm in Brazil. And I never know, uh, I think, have a relationship between uh, DFD because I'm so surprised. I want to know how we detect this. Now I have, I know something about this. If more details, it's better for me, Ox. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. So the second question is about, uh, yeah. Sorry, you know, I, I'm so interesting. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, you told about uh, all three people. You know, in our in our capital, if then we find some people is full. If the village, how we can find? No, no worries, Sam. Thanks for your <laughs> questions. Uh, so, as I understand, if for example, you say if they are, if they go to the city, there's a bench yeah. and there's no internet. How do they? Okay, that's a very good good question. Um, yeah, although nowadays, and also especially, I have found out that in places like Thailand, you have really good internet, yeah. you have a good connection, but yeah, that could happen as well. So one way to do it is having like this type of, uh, maybe like uh, fitness bands or smart watches, mm -hmm. or even either mobile phone, mm -hmm. that, they, that they could do that in a very simple and ingenious way. For example, because the mobile phones have accelerometers and gyroscope, so that indicates the, the the yeah the for example if you are standing or sitting mm -hmm. they can detect that nowadays with the data they collect from from us carrying the, these devices mm -hmm. so one way to do that without connection is mm -hmm. if if the elderly has a fall mm -hmm. and they have a smartphone mm -hmm. then the smartphone could using this using this data that they are anyway they are collecting data on the background all the time from from us the accelerometer if they if they mm -hmm. uh, they have that um, the accelerometer signals um, from accelerometers you can get three types of signals like uh, x y and z mm -hmm. so with that in that case if that signal is indicates that the person or the phone is in um, well say like flat also they have altimeter so they know the, the high and the height where they are using so in that case will be a combination between accelerometer uh, gyros gyroscope for the in terms of the position and the Altimeter. So in that case, well, okay, that's like ground level to, and those that data will be compared to the maybe to the daily patterns. 
typically, okay, most days people have their phone in their pocket mm -hmm. or hands. So that is a change of difference uh, in terms of like height mm -hmm. from this or this height to having the, the device on the ground. And say, if that signals typically go, did you think about these three signals, the X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. then the altimeter signal, the height, like they are being collected as a time series all the time, and then at some point they change, okay, they, they abruptly change to something. If the change is abrupt, and also if that change indicates that the device is on a lower level of in terms of height for a certain time, because the, the person can, can fall and then they can get up, right? So there's no need maybe too much support, but if they have faint or if they fall, and say if they are on the ground, if these signals are like that for five minutes, then the, the the device could be programmed to send like a very loud noise. Okay, put the volume very high and give like some sound, some alarm of help. Hopefully, if it's in the city, yes, there will be people around that could, yeah, could even if they are, okay, you may think in the city, okay, there's a lot of people around, so okay, there's no need, right? They will see that person fall. But if they are going to a restaurant, and in the restaurant they fall, and, and typically you see the toilets, and okay, you see, okay, it's occupied. You, you don't know what's going on there. You, know, you don't know that a elderly person is there falling. So if they're in the toilet and they fall, and they cannot get up, and they are unconscious, the phone will start, you know, beeping or making some noise, and people from the outside will, okay, uh, there's a problem there. So that, that could be a way to do it. But yeah, that's a good question, because we take kind of for granted, we assume that, we have internet, we have good internet everywhere, but the reality is that uh, there are some places that not, like if you go hiking or if you go to the forest, yeah, yeah they could fall and how do they find them? Yeah. Thank you. Question, but okay. Them, okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. The, okay, so the OIT in general, it can be attacked Attack, yeah, IoT, yes. Okay, how we are to protect ourselves about the attack? If uh, we, our house, okay, it's our house about the OIT, so how we do we protect ourselves about the attacks? Uh, you, mean inter you mean in general or particular type of attack? General, and also how do we know? Well, I think the first, uh, the first steps are taking like good, what they call good practice, good practices. Uh, like, um, okay, if you have your mobile phone or your network, like your Wi-Fi network, choose passwords that are strong, like difficult to guess. That will be, okay, like very basic, but that's as a, as a best practice. Or there will be, if you would want to be more protected, maybe like use like a VPN, like a virtual private network, if it's sensitive information, also that the information is encrypted, app backups. And there are also, you can use software that could help you to improve the security in terms of signals. Because as you, as you uh, know, well, all the signals are, uh, we are sending and transmitting all the time from the mobile phones, for email, from Wi-Fi. They, people can use devices that could capture those sounds. I mean, that we, not those sounds, those signals. And they could, for example, get emails. Uh, and they could, they could get the messages, but they are encrypted. So they don't know, and they, the way encryption is works now is, okay, typically, can I remember, maybe a hash, uh, there's some, they have improved a lot. So you, you can, it's very, diffi very difficult to de-encrypt. So they could get the messages, but they don't understand because that's some encryption and you have a key, some type of keys at the, at the, from the sender and the receiver. Uh, that would be a, a way, if you do the, the best practices, that would be the, the first step. If you want to go beyond, yeah, you can use like a VPN, even your own uh, server, but maybe that's for more technical uh, if the users and depends on the level of security and also how how sensitive is the information. Like governments, probably they have lots of uh, information and probably you have heard something about like uh, Tor, the, the project Tor, which has like some type of like uh, onion type of layer. The protection is, has different layers. So that kind of um, measures could be taken. So again, it depends on the, on the type of information. But I, I would suggest as a regular user is the best practices to, to implement. Thank you. Um, any other questions?
How about at the time that we okay or finish? I think I have. Yeah, for, for me, I, I have two questions. Sorry, yeah. you know, I ask a lot. Because yeah, I, no, no, no. Yes, yes, <laughs> only this, yes. Uh, my questions, I am a uh, first, like a student first year. Mm -hmm. I want to be, uh, I want to know about, about uh, technology more. What mm -hmm. kind of uh, advice you give me? And what is, uh, what is the most important subject for me to study? Because me, yeah. I like software very well. I read, I listen, I find many things. Mm -hmm. And all, uh, and all now, and it was here only. I don't know what is uh, important for a software. Can you give me some advice? If can. If I will. Yes, Understand yes. me? What, is, what are the most subjects for a study? For I teach? Okay. Most subjects for a study? Yeah, well, I think on the. <laughs> On the, it's a good question. Uh, on the on the first place, I think I would say all the subjects in your curriculum are important. Don't think that one of them uh, is more important than, for example, databases or software engineering. You say, well, okay, so databases is more important than software engineering. I think it's important to that you know or at least study well all the subjects to the to a level that you understand them, but. The, I think your idea is more about uh, maybe like what could be useful or, or not, right? Because that, that depends, that will depend on you. Okay, what, okay, IoT, computer science, they have different specialized areas, which area you want to go uh, specifically, because if you go for data analysis, data science, uh, software engineering, or information security, they, they all are different applications. But for all of them, you need to know about databases, you need to know about how to program, have that logical thinking, you need to, to know about um, yeah, about software engineering, uh, as well as understanding languages. So in that case, I would say that there are what we call transferable skills. So my, my suggestion to you is yes, to, to start to Maybe, I don't know, it's, if it's your first year, right? Of course, it's my first year. I want to know, uh, you know, if uh, C programming, you know, yeah. coding to create some apps. And software, I study, but I don't know if I want to I understand more and more how we can I, how I can I uh, get, how, what, what, what kind of things I create. You see me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, well, it depends, again, on your interests. For example, if you like developing mobile apps, uh, probably you will go for something like uh, like C Sharp or like um, Android, like Java, which are object-oriented programming languages. So my suggestion, my suggestion to you again is like you at least maybe like an object-oriented programming language, and also Python is also good for in general, like um, for data analysis, for software development, and also another thing to consider is for you to take a look at the what the market requires. For example, if you say, for example, if you want to develop mobile apps and you want to see uh, yeah, in job advertisements, okay, what are they requiring more nowadays? Typically it's, okay, Android, maybe they use some platform like Xamarin, but you can develop once and you develop for different uh, platforms uh, like iOS, Android, and Windows. If you are thinking about developing mobile apps, both for video games, you could use the Unity framework. Again, that's based on C Sharp, and you develop for well, you develop code once and develop for different deploy for different platforms. So again, C Sharp is um, object-oriented programming. So that's uh, again, if you know how to program in Java, you you will understand uh, C Sharp. So. Uh, I think you need to identify which area would you like to, to work on, then also take a look at what is in the market. Because what is, for example, for a software developer, it's not the same. They are not requiring maybe the same uh, the same knowledge or the same tools that were maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago there was a different framework. Maybe there was, Java. 20 years ago, Java was more popular than Python. Nowadays, Python is, at the universities, they are teaching more Python than, than Java. So take a look at what is out there, because if you if you start, uh, if you find in the library some book from 10, 10 years ago and start working, developing in Java, that will be helpful. But it will be more helpful if you take a look and see, OK, they are in the industry, they're using more Python. It's better for you to, OK, have those skills, because 
you will be more competitive. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, uh, I, I get it. I get something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm so happy. Okay. Thank you for your question, Maya. Okay. Uh, we still have maybe the last question. Last question from the male student. Any question? Yeah, just one question. Last question. Okay. 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 This is one. Okay. Uh, our question is uh, a bit more specific. Uh, are you familiar with the infrared technology? The infrared. Uh, a bit, just on the application, like the proximity sensors. Oh, okay. Uh, we we just have a question because we, we are interested in the topic of, for example, uh, AC, the air condition. Mm -hmm. uh, it uses the infrared technology, right? The remote. It uses the infrared, and and in here we can use in here we can use the remotes for different ACs, the same remote for different ACs. So our our question is, uh, can can you can you make it so that the air condition only responds to one one piece one one remote one specific remote? Like you don't want to use the same brand remote, but right. you control to your AC. Can you change the frequency of the receiver of that specific? One? Yeah, well, I'm not familiar with how it works, but in theory, yeah, that, that would be the way because it's it depends on the frequency. So if you change it, if it's a specific frequency for the controller and for the receiver, you could make that kind of narrow it down that uh, that communication. So in theory, yes, I, from, from as far as I know, you should be able to do that. The frequency, if you want to change it, you have to change the hardware, not just the coding stuff. So I think the part of the hardware, yes, some, the, no, both, both the hardware and the software, you, you, need, you, you need to know the, well, in this, that case, software as in the driver or the, yes, for the controller, but that's, uh, I mean, I don't know too much in it specifically, in this case, we use more like a commercial process and we go into more configuration and some adding things, but we even have it, uh, not sure, because the sensors we have used, we, we use, uh, this is from proximity. Proximity. We put in here one, and if someone passes, okay, the it detects that there's someone there. But in this case, uh, I think that can be done. Yeah, the way you are, is that for your own personal interest or a project uh, security? Okay. It's not just right. Yeah, no. I think you, you can do it, and yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I could see the applications because also you could even in. In terms of security as well as in savings, I mean saving energy, right? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yeah, like I, I will pass my details to Sahidon. No. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Matthias, for your talk, for your knowledge to our students uh, regarding to the IoT and the challenge. Uh, at least our students can get some idea uh, when they were in the previous because we had the final final project that student has to do and some of the final project of the previous student is more some of them focusing on the IoT also yeah and then some of them they work about the uh, smart farm yeah oh, really? smart home uh, like you uh, mentioned at your first project and for today is uh, thank you very much for your sharing about your research uh, and uh, we have also some gift yeah to give you okay maybe thank you. Yeah, our head of it department yeah we will deliver okay thank you very much thank you thank you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nobody put questions. <laughs>
Adam will close the door and go. Thank you. Thank you.